So today is uh, Christ the King Sunday. It is officially the last Sunday of the Christian year. And for those of you who maybe grew up in a tradition that didn't celebrate the Christian year, you just had those holidays kind of show up periodically. You wondered, what is this all about? Well, we're formed in a story, a narrative that continues each year over and over and over again. And, and as we follow through this cycle, we celebrate the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the birth of the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we arrive at this, this moment in which we just acknowledge before the whole world that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He is the ruler of all things and the giver of life. And I think that's an appropriate conclusion to the Christian year. What do you think? Now, some of you may be not familiar with the Christian year, so we're just going to go through it really briefly here. Uh, you see, we're at the, the last Sunday of the Christian year, Christ the King Sunday. Next Sunday is what? Advent. We begin the four Sundays of Advent, the season of Advent. That's the beginning of the new Christian year. So you can bring all your new, new Year's Eve things. You actually should have brought them today. But anyways, next, next Sunday is the first Sunday of the Christian year. Uh, during the season of Advent, what we celebrate is this idea of waiting and anticipation. And not only are we waiting for the coming of the Christ child, but we also acknowledge that we're in this process of waiting for the fulfillment of God's kingdom or the return of Christ. And so it's more than just rushing to Christmas. It's also being even more aware that we find ourselves in these between times, the now and the not yet, where the fulfillment of the kingdom has not been revealed yet. And yet we find ourselves living in the midst of this world in these between times, where there's beauty and joy and also suffering and terrible things that go on in this world. And you and I, and I love that text from the Apostle Paul, right? I, I mean, I, could, I, I need to read that over and over and over again. Is this idea that Christ is the head and we are the body. And we have work to do in the midst of this world, in these between times. And Advent reminds us of that. It reminds us that there's work to be done. There's still great suffering in the midst of the world. We're still anticipating a moment for the fulfillment to take place. And we pray that a part of that fulfillment might occur through our own lives as we offer ourselves to the world around us. That's the Advent. So are you excited about that? Yeah. I'm looking forward to the Advent season. Then we get to Christmas, woohoo, birth of Jesus, right? Then we move to Epiphany, which is the season of light. Then we go to Lent, which is a time of reflection, introspection, confession. And we end up at Holy Week. We go with Jesus to Jerusalem. Then Good Friday, crucifixion. And then three days later, Easter resurrection and cartwheels. And then after the season of Easter, we enter into, how many times have you all been on this cycle? Some of you, I know that, that for those of you who haven't been born in this Christian cycle, you're, this is new to you and you get off, but how many of you have been here 21 years? What comes after the season of Easter? <laughs> Pentecost, Pentecost, and the birthday of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit, then we enter into Ordinary time, kingdom time, however you want to title, which we remember the parables, the life and teaching of Jesus. And we go through that cycle over and over and over again, that we may be formed in that story. I am very thankful, the older I get, that I'm part of a tradition that, that works its way through the Christian year. And the reason I think I'm more appreciative of the older I get is it continually reminds me of who I am who I'm called to be in the midst of the world, and how I relate with you all as the church in light of the good news of Jesus Christ. I need to be reminded of that over and over and over again. And each time I encounter it, it's like going back to that familiar place. You learn something new every time you go back, don't you? You have a new experience, a new appreciation. You, you realize something. You see something differently. You get new perspective. And it helps you to continue to move along this journey that we have together, the journey of faith and life. In Christ Jesus, who is the King. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. And so today, it's appropriate, on Christ the King Sunday, that we actually read the last parable in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. 
The parable of the final judgment. Everybody go, ooh. All right, let's try that again. The parable, the final judgment. Ooh. And I know some of you were sitting there when it was being read wondering if you were a sheep or a goat. <laughs> Matter of fact, we do that a lot, don't we? Try to figure out where we stand in that. I'm definitely a sheep. But that person over there is a definitely a goat, you know. We create these us first them scenarios. We like to try to figure out who's who and who's in and who's out and all these kind of things. We just hope that we're in, right? I mean, that's, that's the way... I've read the text over the years. Um, I want sheep insurance. <laughs> How about you? And yet as you read the text and as we dive into the text, uh, it reveals more than just us versus them, sheep and goats. Sure, that's the image that's used for the parable of this teaching, this final teaching that Jesus shares with his disciples according to the Gospel of Matthew before he goes to Jerusalem and to the cross and to resurrection. I mean, this is the last parable that's shared by Matthew to the church that he's writing to. There must be something important in this parable that Matthew wants us to know about the teachings of Jesus. And I think it's more than just creating a scenario, you know, there are going to be some goats and there's going to be sheep. There's a lot more going on in the text that we're being invited into today. And so as we talk about that parable and I want to actually start at the end and then work back to the beginning. There's three things that I want to share with you today that arise from the parable that I think that are really important for us and for our life and the relationship we, we have with the world and our relationship ultimately with, with God and who God is through Jesus Christ. So you ready? So we go to the very end of the, the parable, the basic meaning the basic thing that defines a sheep and a goat, according to this parable, is what? You didn't hear me when I read the parable. You want to get the parable? You want... what, is, what is the basic differentiation between a sheep and a goat? It's what they do or do not do in response to others. Amen? Matter of fact, Jesus goes, he repeats himself twice, doesn't he? The king in the parable repeats himself twice. He reminds them that when they had this encounter with the other, whether they were fed or visited or welcome or given something to drink, that is the differentiating mark between somebody who's living into the love of God in, the, in relationship to the world or is not. And it's quite as simple as that. I remember years ago um, when Keith Green, anybody, anybody know Keith Green? He was one of the earliest Christian musicians out, and I love Keith Green music. And I actually went to see Keith Green at a concert, and a friend of mine says, man, I can't wait for you to go to see Keith Green. And Keith Green was playing on his piano, and he was singing his songs, and he says, just wait till he preaches. And I was like, oh, I can't wait. Now, in those days, good preaching meant at least 30 to 45 minutes. Because that's part of the Pentecostal tradition, right? And Keith Green kind of comes out of that tradition. So I was expecting a sermon with substance. <laughs> now, if you're in that kind of evangelical Pentecostal tradition, time means substance. Okay? My grandfather had a very different opinion of that, though. He was a United Methodist clergy. He was actually chief of chaplains of the United States Air Force. He used to say anything over 15 minutes is a waste of time. <laughs> and I think he might be right. <laughs> Because as I moved along life, I realized that if you can't say what you need to say in 15 minutes, everything else is relatively fluff. Right? So I got to this concert. I was expecting Keith Green to preach his long, elaborate sermon. He read the text from Matthew 25, and he stood up and he looked at the congregation. He says, do you know what the difference between sheep and goats is? It's what they do or do not do. And he sat down. <laughs> But what's interesting in that sermon is I think if he would have kept going, I would have never remembered it. That's all he needed to say. So go home, people. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know better than that. <laughs> well, he's always got more to say. But at the beginning of this parable, or at the end of the parable, that's kind of the substance of it. But what happens sometimes is we kind of get into this kind of dualistic view of it, as if Jesus is trying to create us for them scenarios himself in this teaching. 
that there are goats and there are sheep. And so we spend our whole time trying to figure out who's in and who's out. But that's not the point of the parable. You actually realize that when you're reading the parable and you become aware that both the sheep and the goats have no idea that they've been participating and responding in this way. You hear it in the text, don't you? The king says, you fed me, clothed me, visited me, welcomed me, all this kind of stuff. And what is their response? Their response is, when? When did we do this? Or when did we do this? So it's not like they're playing by a rule book. It's not like they're living into this agenda that's before them. What's, what Jesus is sharing with his disciples is that it's about the relational way of life you live in this world. In other words, the differentiation between the sheep and the goats and, and the way they respond in this little world, the way they act and the way they live their life for others is a response to the relationship that they have with God. Now, of course, don't we talk about this relationship thing all the time, don't we? The meaning of life is... The meaning of life is... The meaning of life is... How many times have I said that over 21 years? I mean, it is the core of my theology. I'm a relational theologian, Amen. Because I believe that the meaning of life is it's a relationship with the living God, the God of life, the God of love. And being in that relationship with God immediately propels me into relationship with you all, whether I like it or not. <laughs> the two are inseparable elements. Now, I know there are a lot of faith traditions out there that get into arguments over works righteousness, over faith alone. And, and i got news for you. Within the Wesleyan tradition, and yes, I'm going to go there. This is where I think us Methodists get it right. For John Wesley, the separation between faith and works didn't exist. If you step into the relationship of love and life and have faith in Christ Jesus, who is Lord over all things, if you enter into this relationship with the living God, you can't help but have your life be transformed in a way that you see others differently. And you're called to respond to others differently because you're being invited into this story in which God makes all the difference. And the story is rooted, its foundation is love. And if the foundation is love, then we respond and we act in love. Amen? Amen. So, when the king asks the sheep and the goats, are actually responsive and says, these are the things you did. And they say, when? When? They were simply just living their life in response to the relationship they had. And that relationship is either rooted in the gift that God gives each and every one of us. Of grace upon grace. Forgiveness and peace. Or it's a relationship just into yourself. Have you ever had that relationship? Now, this is the interesting part of the parable. We're both. We're both sheep and we're goats. You hear me? We're sh-goats. <laughs> But the more we are in this relationship with the living God, the more we participate in the journey, the more that we worship, the more that we pray, the more we surround ourselves with Christian brothers and sisters, the more we feast at the table, the more we're formed in the spirit, the more we enter into this relationship of love. We can't help but share the love of God with others. That's what it means to be formed in Christ. It's as simple as that. When do we do these things, Lord? I have no idea. Well, you've been doing them all the time. How do, how do I do them? I just can't help to do them. They're who I am. It's the new relationship I have with God, which then sends me to a relationship with others. Another interesting thing in the midst of the text, I think this, this kind of blew my mind, <laughs> is the response that the king offers when they ask, when did we do these things? Now, when the sheep respond to the king, the king says, it's when you've done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. When the king responds to the goats, the king responds this way. 
It's when it's done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Did you notice the difference? No, that's why you pay me the big bucks. <laughs> Just tell us, Roy. Oh, here you go. Here you go. The first one he says, it's when you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, that you've done it unto me. The second leaves out brothers and sisters. And that's essential. Because the difference between sheep and goats is that the sheep have eyes for the others as human beings. They never consider the other to be outside, or the enemy, or them. Those who are walking in the life of Christ, experiencing the grace of God, which is unconditional, there's no strings attached, always view the other person as a brother or a sister. They can't see anyone in the world any other way, even their greatest enemy. And if you don't believe me, go read the Gospel of Matthew again. Because Matthew makes that point over and over and over again. Matthew is the love your enemy gospel. <laughs> Luke is too. But anyways, Matthew says it a lot. The gospel is an embodiment of that message. That even your enemy is not an other, is not dehumanized, but is a person of sacred worth in spite of how they're reacting and responding to them. In spite of the, the relationship that you've entered into with them, they are still in person. Amen? Amen. And that's our good work together. That's our good work together. Matthew goes even further, though. He takes this idea of loving God and says it propels us into a relationship of life and work and effort of sharing our lives with others. Matthew's the one that shares this text. You ready for this one? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. but only he or she who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. <coughs> that one hurts, huh? In other words, it's not just being able to say, I love Jesus, or using a lot of Jesus, Lord, praise God, brother, kind of language, right? It's not about wearing the Jesus shirt. It's not about having a sticker on your car. It's not the labels. It's not even going to the altar. According to Matthew, faith in God, which is first and foremost, amen, directly leads us into a relationship with others. But that's the will of God. Amen. But then we go to the beginning of the parable. The third point I want to share with you today. You all remember the beginning of the parable? It begins by saying, and I love this, by the way, uh, at the, the Common English Bible, which is the new translation we've been using here in, at Cornerstone, and is the, technically the, the, the translation that's being recommended across the United Methodist Church, and other denominations too. And I, I have to confess, the first year and a half, it's been tough reading, because I'm not used to it. <laughs> I want to go back to the NRSV. You know, it's more familiar to me. The language that's used in the CV seems, well, it seemed odd. And then there are some of you who are like, NRSV seems odd. I wish we'd go back to the RSV, you know? That seems familiar to you. some of you are like, RSV, forget it. King James Version, right? <laughs> you know, we all have our familiar translation. And, and yet, the CEV is growing. There's some strength in the language that's being used in the sentence structure. Uh, didn't you hear it today when Drew read it in Thessalonians? That, that, that passage impacted me in a different way in that translation than it ever has before. And it's the same thing in the parable today. In the reference to the king, the king is identified as the Holy One. And the Holy One gathers at this throne, and who gathers in front of the Holy One? All nations. Who gathers in front of the Holy One in front of the throne? Everybody. Amen. And this is awesome news, isn't it? It's not just a few nations. It's not just a chosen nation. It's all nations. All nations. Now this probably doesn't seem much to you. But to the audience that Matthew is writing to, it is mind-blowing. 
that he would share this, especially as the last parable. And over the past eight or nine weeks at Cornerstone, if you've been here, and I know some of you haven't, we've been working our way through these parables of Matthew, the, the essential teachings of Jesus. And there has been some tension, hasn't there? Between the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, and this teaching that Jesus is offering. And part of that tension is rooted in the fact that Jesus is welcoming everybody in. And so for those of us in American Christianity, and all of us are part of this process of Reformation, we kind of miss the power and the impact of the teaching of this parable unless you take seriously who Jesus is speaking to when he shares this parable. Because what he's basically telling that Jewish audience that day is that it's not just you. It's everybody. Matter of fact, when the nations gather before the throne of the Holy One, he picks out the sheep and the goats. He doesn't pick them based on border or national title or political allegiance. It's simply rooted in the relationship that they have with the living God and how they share that. Grew up as a good Jew? Well, that's not the only thing. Live your life in abundance to the poor, the lost, the needy, the widow. Care about other people. Those are essential practices. Because when you live into those things, you actually live into the life of God. Happy Christ the King Sunday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.